Tonight, please forgive the pun, but Human Bomb starts off with a bang. Action Comics decides to play 5D chess with multiversal time travel, and Green Arrow. The joke is the writing. All that and more tonight on the Not So New 52. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 66 of the Not So New 52. I am your host, and I got four hours of sleep last night. <laughs> and I know exactly why. It's because YouTube is addictive, at least to me. I, I, you know, you watch one video, and then all of a sudden, you're finding out how a world record was set in a sport that you didn't even know existed before 3 a.m. last night. So... Forgive me if I'm a little bit tired, but today was literally the last day that I was able to record this before release. So, anyway, enough talking about me. Why don't I tell you about the reason you're here? We got a bunch of comic books, specifically 13 of them. And this December 5th, 2012, we have the release of the number 15 issues of Batwing, Detective Comics, Action Comics, Green Arrow, Stormwatch, Animal Man, and Swamp Thing, the number seven issues of Earth 2, World's Finest, G.I. Combat, and Dial H, that being the final issue of G.I. Combat, by the way, the number three issue of The Phantom Stranger, and the start of a brand new miniseries of The Human Bomb, which is written by the same team that did The Ray and The Phantom Lady and Doll Man minis. So... Little amount going on today in terms of events. We, of course, have the Rot World storyline going on with Animal Man and Swamp Thing, and Detective Comics is finally tying into Death of the Family in quite possibly the most meaningless way imaginable. To see what I mean, how about we get into it? Detective Comics number 15, written by John Lehman, art by Jason Fabic. This is, I guess, a Death of the Family tie-in? It says so on the cover, but it got me where. So, we had last issue that Poison Ivy was taken by the Penguin, and Clayface showed up claiming he was Poison Ivy's husband and started beating up Batman. So this issue opens up with, I guess, Penguin's goons are burying Poison Ivy alive, six feet under in some random hill. And then we get flashbacks to how Poison Ivy and Clayface came to be. And we see one month ago they got married in Vegas and then they did a bunch of crime sprees from Houston to Atlanta to Tulsa and finally ending up in Gotham City where, of course, Clayface is all, where is my wife? What did you do to her? I'm going to beat you up, Batman. And... I forget if I mentioned this, but he's covered in vines with a big old red flower on his chest. So clearly, he ain't thinking straight. And Batman straight up says that. He's like, hey, Clayface, you're being an idiot. You are not Ivy's husband. She's clearly controlling you. But, like, Batman knows that the controlling kiss of Poison Ivy only works on flesh and, male, flesh and blood males and not whatever Clayface is, so he's not entirely sure how that could happen. And Clayface is like, nope, you're wrong, we're in love. And it's just basically a big fight in some fire. And Batman's like, I am so not okay right now, and I definitely cannot take on Clayface in a one-on-one -on -one fist fight. So I'm just going to string him up here, and I'm going to leave. So he uses some rope, strings in Clayface long enough to get out the... Uh, window onto the bat plane and he takes that flower that was on clayface's chest to analyze so we go across town the iceberg casino ogilvy shows up to penguin saying like hey we buried poison ivy she's taken care of don't got to worry about that and penguin's like okay yeah that's that sounds great uh good job and Ogilvy's like are you, you all right boss and we see standing in the corner of the shadows is joker 
which I guess makes it the death of a family tie-in. And Penguin's like, yeah, um, so I have to go to Arkham to help out a friend, a very good friend of mine, and I'm going to put you in charge of all my operations until I get back, Ogilvy. It won't be very long. I know I can trust you. Goodbye. And he leaves. And as he's walking out, uh, Joker's still just standing in the room, strangely enough. But Ogilvy's like, oh, what do you mean, your operations? Immediately turning on him. So Batman does some analyzation of the flower, and he also looks through, like, all the things that I guess Clayface was saying. Because, like, during the flashbacks, he wasn't actually saying anything, but Batman specifically says there was no Houston and no other places. So, yeah, clearly Poison Ivy's just been making up this stuff. And he references how she was in Birds of Prey. Doesn't really apply here. So... Clayface is still rampaging through the streets, just like, where is my wife? Tell me where she is. And Gordon's trying to hold him back as best he can with the cops he has. Batman gives Gordon a call, says, get your men off the street. I have a solution. And he shows up in this new bat suit, which it's red. And I don't know why. It doesn't, it doesn't come into anything. So anyway, uh, he's like, all right, here's the thing. Clayface, I'm a, I, you've been seated. She has literally used you as dirt, and that's how she's controlling you, and I'm going to get it out of you, and it's going to burn. And Clayface is like, you already tried fire. That was literally our last fight. And he's like, oh, this isn't fire. This is herbicide. And he pulls out this big flamethrower-looking gun, spits out herbicide mixed with napalm, and it starts getting out all of the seeds that were planted inside Clayface, and then he does the whole explanation. It's this rare flower that leaves you open to suggestion and blah blah blah. And she broke Clayface out of Arkham in order to do have some muscle pretty much. And Clayface's memories start coming back. He stops being controlled and he's like, no she loved me. Ah and he digs his way down into the sewer. Batman quickly follows suit, but he's like, alright, well, you know, it's that was an issue, but this is the death of the family tie-in, so Joker's kind of a bigger priority, so I'm just going to leave Clayface to his own devices. So, then we cut shortly thereafter, and they specifically said earlier on that Poison Ivy only had 30 minutes of air, and she was buried an hour and a half ago. So we see Ogilvy is digging up Poison Ivy, and she gets out of the box, and she's still alive, and she's like... Why are you digging me back? You're the one who buried me here. And he's like, ah, but I buried you with half an hour of air. And I knew that your plant powers would recycle your carbon dioxide back into oxygen, allowing you to not suffocate. See, the penguin wanted you dead. I want you as an ally. And she's like, you work for the penguin. He's like, not anymore. I have stabbed him in the back. And you can call me by my new villain name, Emperor Penguin. Gotta say, not the most creative name. In terms of villainy, especially if you just want to, you know, overcome your... I mean, Emperor, I guess, but it just seems kind of derivative. So, yeah, uh, I liked it. I think it was a solid, like... It's pretty much a one-shot, honestly. If you just had one page at the beginning saying, like, Poison Ivy and Clayface were working together. And then the rest of the issue as it was, like, yeah. That being said, it's a horrible time for Death of the Family. It has absolutely nothing to do with that entire story, save for Penguin is now with the Joker doing something. Which is strange in that it seems even better at forwarding this plot than it does forwarding the Death of the Family plot. So, it's a horrible tie-in, but it's just, it's a good issue. I don't know how you want to take that. So overall, I'm going to say... I mean, art's fantastic. Jason Favick does great. The Batsuit, I, I honestly feel like that was just Jason Favick being like, Hey, I drew this really cool Batsuit. Uh, can we work it in somewhere? And uh, John Lehman was like, yeah, okay, I got a place for it. Uh, but yeah, overall, I'd say this is probably, maybe a 7.5. It's it's horrible in terms of a tie-in. Like, the fact that it's even called a tie-in is a rip-off. If like, oh, I'm going to buy all the Death of the Family stuff. This is a rip-off in that. But... It's an okay issue. It's it's solid in terms of what the story's doing. It's furthering the Emperor Penguin stuff, and I'm interested to see how far it's going to go. So, 7.5.
Animal Man number 15, written by Jeff Lemire, art by Steve Pugh and Timothy Green II. So last issue left off with Animal Man and his little roving gang being attacked by Grodd and a bunch of other gorillas, including the Brain and Monsieur Mala. And it's basically everyone's knocked out because of the mental powers except for Steel. And he's like, all right, gorillas, I'm going to start blasting you. And then Monsieur Mala starts blasting Steel. And he's like, ow, all right, get off me. And so they come up to uh, Animal Man. They're like, wait a minute, this guy kind of smells like a gorilla. And Animal Man's like, because I'm using gorilla powers. And he's like, what? You saying something to Grodd? And he's like, yeah, because I'm using gorilla powers. Punch. Punches him in the face. And then everyone else manages to shake off the mental attack from Grodd. And they're like, all right, let's get to it. And Monsieur Mel is about to start shooting them all. And all of a sudden, a giant sword comes out of nowhere and stabs the brain in the brain. And it turns out that it's Frankenstein and his army of patchwork people. Frankenstein's got his own tie-in to this. It is not complete yet, but I guess this is where we're getting to. So, Frankenstein rides in, he basically helps take out all the gorillas, he blows Monster Mala's head off, and Animal Man punches out Grodd. And once all the gorillas are taken care of, they're like, cool, great, good job everybody, Frankenstein's here to help. And at that point, they're like, hey, Frankenstein, if you're looking for vengeance, we could really use some help. We're going after the Arcane's castle. And he's like, that is suicide. Even for us dead army people, like, that ain't gonna work. I've sent some scouts out there, and they always come back scared and talk about some giant guardians. And it's like, well, we gotta do something soon, Animal Man complains. And he's like, look, my, soon everyone's gonna be dead. And he's like, I mean, I've mastered my creator's ability to create life. I can bring back everybody as undead patchwork people, and then the rot can't affect them. And they're like, okay, but let's try a different option, because that doesn't seem like a good a good end game there. And he kind of shrugs it off, and he's like, all right, well, here's the thing. I heard, I've heard rumors that there is a prison deep below Metropolis for somebody that's so powerful that they could take on Arcane. Like, they're so powerful that Arcane couldn't convert them or destroy them. And, of course, Metropolis, everyone's like, you think it's Superman? And they explain, like, well, Superman fought alongside Steel for, like, months to hold off the rot, and then one day he just disappeared. We never found a body. We didn't see him die. It's possible it's him. So, like, okay, well, regardless, if it's somebody who can help us in the fight, we got to go to Metropolis. So Frankenstein's army and our little roving gang are making their way to Metropolis. Meanwhile, we cut to the uh, plot with Maxine running into William Arcane, and she's like, oh, William Arcane, that name sounds familiar. And she's like, yeah, you, I think you met my sister. It's like, yeah, I know, your sister's cool. Are you also cool? And Sox is like, for the love of God, he is so not cool, Maxine. We got, this is a trap, like, you cannot believe. And he's like, no, 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 I'm also a good Arcane. Like, my powers allow me to remove the rot from people. Like, I just removed the rot from this these two old ladies and a boy and it's like that sounds like my mom my grandma and my brother and he's like oh yeah they did kind of look like you come on i have them in this barn way down the road and socks is again like for the love of god maxine do not do this and she's like shush that's my family you're talking about we're going so they make their way down to this farm down the road and he's like i promise they're safe and he opens up the door and inside are the two hunters who are still, quote-unquote, alive, and the family who is still rotified. So, he lied. He's not good. So then we cut over to the rot world again, and the caravan is making their way down there. And they're like, okay, well, the patchwork army doesn't need to sleep, neither does steel, uh, but the rest of them do. So, they're all going to fall asleep inside of a uh, caravan and try to get some rest. And just a point of note is that Beast Boy has started wearing Monster Mala's beret and, like, ammo clip, mag, whatever you want to call it. So anyway, they all start falling asleep, and Buddy has a dream. He's back at home, and he's like, oh, I had a horrible dream. Maxine's waking him up, saying, like, oh, you, you said you were going to make us pancakes. And they go downstairs, and 
uh, Ellen is down there making some coffee. And he's like, hey, where's Cliff? And all of a sudden, Ellen gets quiet. And Maxine's like, well, he's in the backyard, of course. So Buddy goes down to the backyard. And his eyes start bleeding profusely. And as he makes his way over to the uh, corner of the yard, he sees Cliff lying in an open grave. Just like, hey, Dad. And he's wearing like an animal man costume. He's like, hey, Dad. I think I kind of ruined your costume as we see his entire chest and guts are just pouring out. And he's like, oh, it's okay, though. I got to be a hero just like I always wanted. And so then he shoots back awake. And they're like, hey, cool, we made it to Metropolis. But as they look out over Metropolis, it is covered in plant life. And they're like, that's weird. Plants, I thought this was rot infested. I thought there was no more green. And they're like, okay, well, not all of the green is good like it is a spectrum some things are closer to the rot so yeah it might be an issue so at that point the roving gang make their way down the patrick army is just keeping an eye on things from above and they use beast boys uh he turns into a bloodhound and he starts sniffing out and they find their way down into the prison like immediately and they're like this seems really easy this shouldn't be this easy but there literally is no sign of the rot anywhere, so screw it. And they slash their way into the prison, and inside is Green Lantern. But not like anybody we know. It's not Hal or Guy or John or Kyle. It is a plant-based Green Lantern who has spread his vines across Metropolis. I'm sure he has a name, but they don't give it. So, yeah. Um, didn't see that coming. Didn't see it being Green Lantern. I guess it kind of makes sense. I mean, I know that some versions of the green are linked with Green Lantern, but I don't think main continuity has that yet, but maybe we'll get something because this guy's plant-based. Who knows? Regardless, I think it was a solid enough issue. I think the Maxine plot's a little bit meh. Just in, like... I get that we're getting to the point where she is going to, like, immediately fall because it has to happen for this timeline to happen. But that's, at a certain point, she's too trusting, you know? Like, I know she's, like, four, but still, she should know a little bit better than to talk to strangers. So, overall, though, it is a good issue. I'm going to say... I'm going to say seven. I think it's it's a solid issue. It is just kind of, like... A middle bit, though, where we found a new side plot that we're going to take and we're going to get a new party member along with it. So a little bit of a divergence, but it's interesting enough and we get to see Frankenstein swing back into the main parts of the story. So, yeah, can't really complain. Seven for this. Swamp Thing number 15, written by Scott Snyder, art by Marco Rudy. Last issue, we had Abigail get jumped by her uncle Anton Arcane, and Swamp Thing and Dead Man get jumped on their way to Gotham by William Arcane, who now wields all the powers of the sea because he literally has Aquaman's trident. So he jumped him with a giant Starro. Like, just Starro, which is actually an alien, not a sea creature, but regardless... Uh, it attacks them, and it apparently, you know, it swallowed them. It has some acid inside of it, starts melting away at Swamp Thing's ferns, and Boston's like, oh, it's burning through the green, you gotta stop it, Alec! And Alec's like, all right, sure, and he s does this giant slash, which cuts Starro clean in half, and they both manage to escape. And at that point, William's like, you killed, you killed my starfish, man. What the heck? Oh, well, I've got a lot of pets. And he raises, like, this giant kraken shark thing. And it's like, all right, well, that's that's going to be a bit harder to beat. And William just says, like, here's the thing. I'm not against you because you're green. Like, that doesn't matter. I'm against you because you loved my sister. And I hate my sister. So maybe if you scream and howl and make it good enough, I'll tell you how she died. And so we cut to before Rot World, Abigail is being strung up by Anton, and he's like, oh, hey, you're waking up, been waiting for this reunion, this little family reunion here. And she's like, you're not my family, you suck. And he's like, oh, okay, fair enough, but um, I wasn't talking about you. And she 
open he opens up this curtain and there are all these clones in vats and it turns out they are all clones of Abby and he's just like yeah remember when I bit you in like issue 11 I made it into clones and the only thing they're lacking is brains so uh they're like actually perfect and he says she's like oh I'll kill you for this you evil bastard and he's like well you would, but every time that you had enough power to actually, like, beat me, beat me, I've managed to stop you by making you forget using these flowers. So, uses the flowers on her again, and she starts forgetting again. So then Swamp Thing shows up, and, or sorry, Swamp Thing, cut back to that, and Boston's like, okay, here's an endless supply of fish things that can attack us. There's only one way this is going to stop, and that's if I stop him. So Boston goes up and he's like, I'm going to possess a being of the rot, which is probably going to like tear me to shreds. So give my regards to Gotham. And he goes up and he possesses William, makes William take the dive and yeah, saves the day. So then we go back to Abby. She's having a nightmare that she usually has with Swamp Thing by her side, but now she's alone. And she goes down to this door, cracks it open, sees there are people behind who want to be saved. And then Anton comes up behind her and tries to snuff her out with the flowers. But then Abby wakes up and she's like, no, no more forgetting. I'm going to remember how to beat you. And she gets super powered, supercharged, breaks out of her restraints, and then uses her rot abilities to literally melt Anton's flesh. And Anton's like, you know, I'm the avatar of the rot, right? I'll just come back in a few minutes. She's like, a few minutes is all I need, squish. So then she's like, all right, well, I'm going to go and open that door that's in all my dreams but first and she smashes all of the clones and the vats and it's like good all right great so she hears chanting from outside the huge crowd that was out there saying like oh the mouth the mouth hurry the mouth and she makes her way down opens up the door but it's too late everyone there has already turned into rot people which i don't know if that was like i feel like i wasn't really foreshadowed this enough that there were even people down there it was just kind of a blurry dream regardless all of the people are watlings so we go back to gotham city and rot world swamp thing has made it and he's literally made it into the bat cave and as he looks across he's like well it's just a dead place there's nothing oh hey there's batman and batman's just sitting at the bat computer and he goes up and he touches him he's like alec hoblin jesus I've been, I've been traveling for weeks what's up man and as he goes to touch batman we see that batman has also been infected by the rot but he has been chained down but swamp thing's too close and he does manage to get some attacks in on swamp thing until all of a sudden shotgun out of nowhere blows batman's head off and it looks to be man bat but then Manbat starts detransformation, turning back into a human. He's like, oh my god, Alec Holland, Bruce was right. It's me. It's Barbara Gordon. So Barbara Gordon took the Manbat serum and is one of the few surviving people here in Gotham. And also just blew Batman's head off. So there's that. Um, I liked it. I think it was a good issue. Again, I feel like the Abbey bit is a bit confusing like it didn't quite explain what it was doing that whole time she her purpose that she explicitly said was she was going to try to stop like this whole thing before it happened but i it didn't really explain how and it seemed like it all came down to she has to open up this door i don't know it was just a little bit confusing maybe i missed something maybe i didn't read something properly but it was a little bit confusing to me so i'm thinking part of the plot though i enjoy it's weird the dead man is just so quickly gone especially because william yes he is a person of the rot but he also is not dead you know or at least i don't think he is he seemed pretty pretty normal all things considered so yeah weird dead man's out but it's still a good issue i'm gonna say seven um Again, the criticisms that I said, and it is kind of just adding in more trials. We're not making forward pro I mean, he got to Gotham, which is something, but it is now the, oh, now Dead Man's gone and he's lost all this. And, like, it, it, we have yet to see this last bastion of hope that they, he was looking for. So, 
yeah, it's iffy, but I do think it's a solid story. So seven for this, and we will see what happens next time. Batwing number 15, written by Fabian Nicieza, art by Fabricio Fiorentino, which is different from the people who have been writing this, but it still continues on the same story. So, yeah, so we open up with, uh, I mean, last issue we had, what's her face, uh, Rachel. She got stabbed by Father Lost, and Batwing's like, no. So this issue picks up with David doing some soccer skills and he's like hey what do you think of this and she's like i'm so angry because the world is the way it is and david's like yeah you you need to let that go otherwise it's gonna get you killed and then we see nowadays where she's sitting in a pool of blood and she's got a giant dagger in her stomach and father lost is like well didn't really want to get involved but she was being a pain in the butt so here we go batwing and batwing comes in being like oh this is it i'm coming after you and then Father Lost just does the mind control thing again because Batwing has yet to come up with anything that can work against that. But this time we see internally like a sort of subconscious thing where Father Lost is like, hey, you know, most people in their subconscious are like, you know, big and egotistical, but you are like small and pathetic. And therefore I'm just going to boop and he pulls his heart right out of his chest. And then we see his whole history of like, oh, here's how he became Batwing. He was, you know, child soldier and whatnot. And then Father Lost is like, you know, me and you aren't so different. I also lost, like, my family and stuff like that. But then one day I met, quote-unquote, her, and she told me I was special. And apparently she gave him the gift of this mind control stuff and basically told him, like, hey, look, don't be, don't bury down your anger. Use it. Make it a weapon. Um, inflict it on others because what's the point of having gone through such horrible crap if you can't make other people go through horrible crap as well and that's immoral so at that point uh police start showing up and father lost is like all right well since i'm doing the mind control thing on you attack the police and um kill them so father lost starts making his exit and the police all start surrounding the area and batwing just starts unloading on them like he's got some uh flashbangs he just starts beating the crap out of people's faces and when he sees kia she's like oh kia she's my best friend and i want her to be so much more i want her to be a blood smear on the ground so you know quite a little bit and it seems that kia actually recognizes that this is david but she doesn't immediately say anything but Matu's on the comms, and he's like, hey, um, I'm going to stop you now if that's cool. And he presses a button, which causes a like electric shock through his system, and his suit locks up. And Kia's like, oh, hey, there's my niece. She's getting away. Oh, but Batwing was attacking me. And so Batwing finally is like, or sorry, one of the other cops tries to take off Batwing's mask, and Kia fires a shot in the air, being like, uh, don't do that. It's probably booby-trapped. And he's like, good call. So Batwing once again gets another shock uh, to really get him out of the mind control stuff. And Matu's like, you good? And he's like, yeah, I'm good. Please stop shocking me. And so at that point, he just walks over to Rachel, picks her up, and flies her to the hospital. She manages to get stabilized. And as she wakes up, she's like, oh, am I being under arrest? Because you're dressed as a cop, David. And David's like, no, 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 you're not under arrest. But... What happened? She's like, I embraced my anger. Uh. So at that point, David's called in the, to the police department. Or, you know, he's in the police department. He's called into the back room. And Kia's like, hey, you want to tell me anything? And he's like, nope. And she's like, all right, play it that way then. So they say, all right, we've, we've got something that we can finally do. It has, we're adding some tech to the suit to stop the mind control stuff. It could end up killing David but not before it takes out Father Lost. So at that point, we see uh, all these other people who are being controlled. They are all drawn to this low-level Sonic thing, which I guess is what Father Lost is using to control. And Father Lost is like, all right, well, I, you were a fool to come here. It, this was, I own you. And Batwing activates the weapon, which causes Father Lost the same amount of pain. Like it blows it back at him. 
And so Batwing flies up in the air. He drops a whole bunch of the uh, tech in order to basically put a... It's a Faraday cage. It severs the connection that Father Lost has on all of his guys. And Father Lost tries throwing a punch at Batwing. He nearly falls off a building and Batwing's like, Oh, you know who owns uh, my body and soul? It's me. And we see Father Lost losing his grip and Batwing's about to let him drop it. He's like, no, I'll save him because he, he deserves actual real punishment. So we get the little epilogue page here. Rachel disappears again. Everyone's like, oh, Father Lost, like what happened there? Leela gets home safe, uh, Kia's niece. And at that point, uh, David's like, or Kia's like, David, Batwing, why do you think he does what he does? And David's like, you know, I don't really know anymore. So leading on some sort of a cliffhanger there. It's it's a fine wrap-up to the arc, but it does feel very fast. It feels very like, okay, yeah, this was kind of just spinning its wheels a little bit. And then all in one issue, he was attacked mind-controlled, snapped out of it. His friend may have discovered his identity. They found a way to sever the thing. They completed in severing the connection, and then they arrested him. All that in one issue, very fast. And even then, it still felt like it took some time to do other stuff. Now, fast isn't inherently bad, but it did feel rushed. So it's fine. It's not the best wrap-up to an arc. I mean, I was already a little bit iffy on this arc to begin with because it just didn't seem to have, like, a real focus to it it was just kind of doing some other thing for a while and then it was like and then batwing gets involved if they went in more as to like how this cult was actually i don't know a, i wanted to be more directly connected to batwing i guess is the issue it just felt like batwing showed up because why not he's he's the hero that they deserve so overall i'm gonna give this one a uh, I'll give it a six, and it's not that, like, new writer, the writing was fine, the art was fine, it was just, this should have been, like, two issues. It was just a bit too fast, so six for this. Action Comics number 15, written by Grant Morrison, art by Rags Morales and Brad Walker. Buckle up, kiddos, because we've got a Grant Morrison explanation issue. So last issue was this whole thing where he finally managed, Superman managed to attack Vindictivix on Mars. So that happened. Now this issue, we pick up uh, Prom Night. Clark Kent has going with Lana Lang, and she's like, Ma Kent's like, oh, I'm so happy for you. It's great. As soon as your pa's done helping out that salesman guy with his car, you'll be on the road. And we see that the salesman is actually Vindictiv- Vindictivix. Uh, I'm going to call him Vinny. It's going to be easier for me. So anyway, Superman's like, yeah, I think about that night a lot. And the landlord who he's talking to, and this is the framing device for the entire rest of the book, is this conversation with the landlord. Uh, she's like, yeah, before Vinny, I don't think it was supposed to end as tragically as it did. And he's like, okay, so let me just recap. You're a princess in the fifth dimension, and someone named Mixipitlik is needing to be saved from Vinny. And I'm going to say Mixi instead of Mixipitlik. So she's like, yeah, okay, here's the thing. Uh, I had to show you that I was part of the fifth dimension, which I think happened two issues ago, in order for you to believe me. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I've done that. And she's like, Superman's like, okay, I'm having these memories of being to Mars, but I've never actually been to Mars. And she's like, that's happening like two years from now. Apparently, when Vinny goes in for the kill through time, he displaces events around it. So his prey, like, remembers things that haven't happened yet. So, yeah. Anyway. Then we cut to, I guess, the future, where it is the final days of Superman. The sky is red. It's a red sun. And we see the Kryptonite gang and Nimrod 
are tracking him down through the ruins of Metropolis. And he's on the run. And that little girl, I think Lucy, uh, she's like, oh, I smell his thoughts. He's here. And so uh, the Kryptonite gang, Nimrod, Lucy, and the Metal X are all going after him. And Nimrod's like, hey, I put a whole bunch of, like, Tesseract bombs everywhere, which will cause all these new environments to spring up if he activates them. So don't worry. He's not going anywhere. And he ends up springing a bomb that causes, like, a giant plant life to form. So he drops down in the sewer, and he runs into Drekken the Evolver from before. Anyway, back to the framing device. Uh, Landlady is like, oh, yeah, here, Superman, share a drink with me while I tell you the story of what's up. He's like, I don't really drink. And he's like, you're Superman. The alcohol literally will do nothing to you. So he says, all right, here's the story. In the fifth dimension, there was a king. I'm not even going to try his name. But the king lost his queen, and he was heartbroken. And it was, like, spreading darkness across the land because he was so sad. And he had a royal advisor guy named Vinny. And Vinny was trying to cheer him up with all of these, like, numbers and letters that could fly around and such and none of it was working and then one day Mixie showed up and he's like hi I'm Mixie and I can make anyone smile and he took off his little pearl purple bowler hat and he pulled out an entire universe and that made the king finally smile he was like oh that's incredible so then he didn't like that anyway at this point she starts listening off a whole bunch of names of people who were trying to get Mixie to say his name backwards and were unable to. And apparently saying fifth dimensional names is like thunder as we see Superman's ears are literally bleeding. So she continues on the story. Mixie fell in love with the landlady. Again, she has a name. And in order to prove his love, he gave her a necklace made of three wishes. So that made Vinny enraged that he's Mixie's moving in on all fronts here so then she explains like Vinny got or, and the whole reason the Superman's involved because he asked how does this have anything to do with me is because in his future Mixie uses Superman as one of the tricks to cheer up the king and he's a favorite because Superman actually manages to like get one up on Mixie a lot of the time so anyway Vinny's super pissed off and he goes into like the royal armory and he pulls out a thing called the Nothing Coat, the Imaginator, and the Million Pointed Spear. Yes. So at that point, we cut back to the future one. Superman is fighting Draken and the Kryptonite gang. He is clearly not on the upper hand, but he manages to get away long enough to make it to his new base because his Arctic Fortress of Solitude was taken over. So now he's at a base in the Yucatan in an Incan temple. And he goes inside and he's like, all right. Legion of Superheroes, I need you back here with me now. I need Comet and the Cometeers and also Crypto, good boy. And he whistles for Crypto. So anyway, back to the story. Vinny manages to, he goes into the King's uh, quarters where he knows that Mixie is. He sees through the curtains a shadow of the bowler hat. And so he takes the million pointed spear and he stabs at it. But it turns out that the King was just trying on the bowler hat. So he actually ended up killing the King. When he stabbed the king with the multi-pointed spear, that was the multitude that was killing all these different planets on the list. And only two planets managed to repel it. Superman, when he was on Mars, two years from now, and Jor-El for Krypton. Okay? You keeping up? I barely am. So at that point, uh, Mixie's like, oh my gosh, what did you, you killed him. And the crime, or sorry, the punishment for regicide is eternal imprisonment. So we see that Vinny's arm has been like shriveled up and his nothing coat has been broken. And he's going to try to frame Mixie for killing the king. So Superman puts together the multitude thing and it's just like, yeah, okay. So somehow this guy has been taking revenge on me throughout my entire life all at once like he's able to attack anywhere in superman's timeline and that when we cut back to prom we see lana's enjoying herself they're about to share a kiss when the police walk in and clark realizes ma and pa were in a car accident and they didn't make it so then back to the story the princess uh mixie was telling 
the princess to run and she ran and threw off two dimensions while she was at it and she was reborn as a baby 60 years ago and it like in our world and she used one of her wishes to bring Mixie to Earth which is how she like married her husband the mystic Mr. Triple X that we brought up God knows how long ago and then her second wish was to undo the death of Clark Kent and Superman's like, cool, use your third wish to get rid of Vinny. And she's like, unfortunately, I died before I used my third wish. Because remember, she sees time differently. And at that moment, Nimrod shoots her in the head. And Superman's like, oh, geez, oh, God, M Mrs. Nixley. So then we get three panels all throughout time of present day, prom night, and the future, where everyone's like, there you are, and they're all attacking Superman. Oh my god. Okay. I get it. I understand. We have a being who can like see Superman's entire timeline and attack it all at once. And he's been doing so just because he doesn't like that Superman made the king happy in the fifth dimension. I get it. I understand. Does not make it any less complicated. I like it though. I do think that it did a good job pointing out like, okay, here's the story. Here's how I'm able to... I followed this so much easier than I thought I would be able to. I'm sorry if I didn't explain it well, but like art-wise, writing-wise, I got it. So overall, I got to give this one like, I got to give it at least a, I'll say eight. No, I'm going 8.5 actually. I think that it is a really solid, just like, okay, we're not only breaking down like this entire series up to this point, but we're also talking about just, Things that are coming after this as well. The entire timeline is up for play. And I don't know. I like it. I think it's a solid, solid issue. So I'll give it an 8.5. I think it was very creative and I really did enjoy it. Earth 2, number 7, written by James Robinson. Art by Yildare Sinar. Uh, last issue was the end of the arc. They beat Solomon Grundy, and Alan Scott restarted the planet. And this issue picks up with the planet being like, hey, we got new superheroes. Also, the planet's kind of being fixed. So that's neat. And um, also, there was that news story that Alan Scott was reported to be on a train that crashed. But it turns out he's fine. And then we cut to him in his room, mirror smashed, room torn apart, clearly not fine. And as he walks his way over to the balcony, it's of course apparent that he's grieving over the loss of his boyfriend slash fiance. And he walks over to the balcony and Hawkgirl's there. And she's like, oh, hey, uh, you know, I'm pretty good at cracking puzzles and whatnot. But here's the thing. We, there was a green lantern sighting at that uh, train crash. And you miraculously survived the train crash. This is not the hardest puzzle to put together. And he's like, yeah, well, I know your name is Kendra, so whatever. And she's like, yeah, my name is Kendra Mun Munoz Saunders. And she's like, oh, wait, Saunders, you're an archaeologist, actually more of a tomb raider. And she's like, yeah, you guys did a piece on me a couple years back. It was very unflattering, but also mostly true, so whatever. And she explains how she was a tomb raider. One day the World Army was contacting her saying, hey, can we get your help with something? And she was cursed with this pair of wings ever since then. And he's like, curse? That's, that's kind of a strong word. You're a superhero. You're a wonder. And she's like, yeah, well, you can't really go into a bar with six foot wingspan. So anyway, she explains like, hey, look, I'm sorry to hear about your boyfriend, whatever. But here's the thing. We need to form a team. We're the new wonders. We got to we gotta work together here. We got to be a team. And Alan's like, no, I'm not not really a team player. I'm kind of a lone wolf kind guy and uh, I don't really need your help. And she's like, well, here's the thing. Without your ring, because your ring can't fail, we've already seen that, you're simply mortal. And she fires off a crossbow, which goes straight through the ring into a nearby photo of Alan and his boyfriend, Sam. And Alan gets super pissed that the photo was ruined. The ring flies onto his finger, but Kendra's already gone. And then we get the bulk of the issue, which also seems like it's going to be the bulk of the series, is we have this back and forth between uh, Sloane and 
Amar, the commander of the world armies and the guy who literally blew up like God knows how many cities in order to take out Apocalypse. And Sloan has just been given basically the top lead science division or uh, post in the world army. And Amar's like, the, he is literally a genocidal maniac. And they're like, yep, but he's a damn smart one. So you're going to work with him. And Sloan and him walk and talk down the hallways. And they're just like, hey, look, we don't trust each other. But we're going to do this thing. Like, we both want what's best for the world, even if it's in opposite ways. So you're going to keep tabs on me. I'm going to keep tabs on you. That's how it's going to go. And Sloan's like, I'm sure you already found out about, like, the hidden base I have. And he's like, what hidden base? And he's like... Do I even have a hidden base? I don't know. I'm not, I didn't say anything. So then cut to uh, the hidden base being revealed as a building in Paris. And Amar is like, all right, Wesley Dodds and your Sandmen. I need you to break into that place and figure out what in the heck's going on. Also, we believe that he has an individual named Michael Holt in there, a.k.a. a guy named Mr. Terrific. Dude just showed up out of nowhere one day, and Terry Sloan just came out, said hi on Terry Sloan, and took him in. Go rescue that man. And the Sandmen are like, right, we'll go in and we won't be caught. So they bust in, but as soon as they get inside, Michael Holt is alive and well, and he's just in there waiting. He's like, Terry Sloan's not in, man. I take a message. Punch. And, you know, big fight scene breaks out. But they do end up putting... Uh, Michael to sleep, but not before he reveals that he is in service to Terry Sloan and is doing anything he wants. So, probably a mind control thing. Anyway, flash over to Tokyo, Japan. Sloan and Amar are talking about one of the Science Division's earlier projects called Red Tornado, a robot that was designed to be a wonder, but they could never quite get it working. So Sloan's like, I'm going to take this, I'm going to get it working, and we're going to use it, Okay. And it's like, all right, I mean, we weren't that stupid beforehand. Some sounds like, you know, you were absolutely that stupid beforehand. That being said, Amar, I don't know if you're stupid. Either you are an idiot and you actually are working with me without any other underhanded motives, or you are on my level and you're playing the chess game with me. And it's like, eh, I don't know. But regardless... The reason that I have any sort of upper hand on you is that the world doesn't know about you and what you've done. I can easily just leak that and ruin your life. So, gotta play that part of the game. So anyway, uh, Dodds is catching up with Amar saying like, yeah, okay, we got in there, we copied all the science stuff, and then we just raised the place to the ground. All of it's gone. He'll think that it was, we made it look like it was apocalyptic in origin, so... I'm sure he won't suspect anything at all. And we got Michael Holt. He is safe. He is here. And Amar's like, you do understand by doing this, you are actually committing treason against the world army, right? And he's like, yeah, well, Terry Sloan's a dick, so uh, better I work with you than with him. Besides, you guys are going to be playing your chess game or whatever, so have at it. And then we get to just get one final shot of Sloan standing in front of the Red Tornado saying, don't make no mistake with Terry Sloan, there is no fair play. It's a Mr. Terrific line, for those of you who don't know. Um... It's good. It's fine. I think I think that the Amar and Terry Sloan stuff is, like, the weakest to me. But it seems like that's what's going to be getting the most focus. If they can develop it in a way that I'm interested in, then, yeah, I'm all for it, clearly, if I get interested in it. But I don't know. I'm much more interested in seeing them develop the justice society, like, of this planet, you know, Show me more with Jay Garrick. Show me more with Alan Scott. Get a few more of those characters rolling. Clearly, we have Red Tornado on the horizon, which uh, is interesting. But I'm not so interested in the political intrigue. If they can make it something I'm cool with, then fine. But as it stands now, it probably gets like a... It gets a 7. Because it is still very well done. It's not a poorly done book. It's just missing... The little something that I... It's focusing on the parts I don't particularly enjoy, but I can recognize the quality therein. So, seven for it right now. Hopefully we can either get interesting or pivot to something that is more interesting. Cool. 
Green Arrow, number 15, written by Anne Nascenti, art by Freddie Williams II. Last issue was a tie-in to Hawkman Wanted. It has nothing to do with this at all. And this issue opens up with Green Arrow attacking some fishermen. But they aren't actually fishermen. They're running guns. And there are a bunch of assault rifles and stuff like that. And he's like, these aren't used for hunting. They're used for killing people. Therefore, I shall dump them into the ocean. My head hurts. And so he dumps them all into the ocean. He looks down and sees the fishermen like, can you guys swim? And they're like, yeah, of course we can swim. Shut up, Green Arrow. You suck. So at that point, a dog starts attacking him. And he's like, oh, no, a dog's attacking me. My head hurts. And he's... He immediately flips one dog off a pier. Two other dogs are there, and he talks to the guy who's running the dogs. He's like, hey, call those dogs off. I don't kill dogs. My head hurts. And we see it's a guy named Harrow, who is just a bland-ass dude who's missing an eye, and he uses ice picks as his weapons. And he's there with a dog, and he's also there with a short little guy named Pike. And... They're just standing off on this pier. Green Arrow's got his arrow trained on him. And he's like, I'm going to kill you where you stand, Green Arrow. You just dumped all my guns into the sea. And he's like, you sure you want to do that? Out in public where people can see? And it turns out there's a boardwalk like 10 feet away where there are nearby runners like, Hey, Green Arrow, you coming to the parade later? And he's like, probably not. Thanks for the invite. And they're like, cool. Are you okay, by the way? And he's like, great. So then Harrow's like, all right, fine, I'm putting 50 grand on your head, though. You're a dead man. Start running. And so he, Green Arrow literally starts running, despite the fact that clearly he couldn't have put the hit out yet. And then he remembers, like, oh, yeah, my head hurts because it got I got bonked in the head during Hawkman Wanted. I probably should have that looked at. And he starts, like, stumbling around the streets until finally, like, a kid is like, hey, Mr. Arrow, you tripped. Are you okay? And Arrow's like, I'm good. I just got to get back home. So he makes his way over to the warehouse where they're currently staying. And he just literally re-explains the past four pages again to his team while saying, I also think I might have a concussion. And the one guy's like, yeah, no, you might have like a brain bleed or something like that. You really need to go get checked out. And he's like, no, I'm fine. I'm good just tell me where to go next. And they're like, dude, you're the one who brought it up. What? <laughs> What's the matter with you? So he lists off some stuff about the guy who had the dogs. And he's like, ah, oh, yes, I heard him say something about Harrow. And they say, oh, yeah, he's a lifelong con, in and out of prison, runs a dog fighting rink. Also, ice pick is his thing because his father tried to kill him with an ice pick and he lost an eye. So at that point, they're like, Okay, well, we've got a lock on his location. And then Arrow's like, but if we can find him, then he can find us. Pack all this up. we got to go. And I'm, me personally as a reader, I'm like, that doesn't make any sense at all. How is, what? So then he starts exiting and he makes a comment about all these photos on the wall nearby. And they're like, hey, who are these guys? And it's like, uh, that, you, you made that. That's called your wall of shame. It's all the villains you've fought over the course of this series. And they're like, oh yeah, this one girl wanted to be a robot. And it's like, yeah. Anyway, and so then he just leaves. So then we go to Harrow's dogfighting area, which is in the back of like a fishery. They're using ice picks to break up all this ice. And then this woman walks in uh, named Gloria. And she's like, oh, is Harrow in the back room? I gotta go talk to him. So she makes her way back, and Harrow's like, get me the head of Green Arrow, and I'll give you 50 grand. But in the meantime, let's get this dogfight thing going on. And you think the dogfight they meant two dogs fighting, but it turns out he's trained a dog named Jaws, and he's saying anyone who can beat up my dog will get uh, this diamond ice pick, and also replacing bets on you. So then Pike from before, he steps up and he's like, let me at him, let me at him. And everyone places bets against Pike because he's a short little guy fighting a dog. So Green Arrow, he figures out where they need to go. But before he can get there, some dude just unloads a machine gun in the middle of the street at Green Arrow. He fires off some arrows, takes the guy down, and he's like, what was that for? And he's like, you got money on your head. And he's like... Where are they? He's like, I'm not going to tell. He's like, I'm going to take your eyeballs. He's like, they are at this warehouse. So he gets the location, 
fight scene continues between Pike and the dog. Green Arrow is now watching on. He's like, this guy's a good fighter, but he's going to need to do this crazy move in order to win. And then he does a crazy move and he's like, all right, cool. So the dogs win. Turns out Gloria placed a bet on Pike winning. So she just made a buttload of money. And she comes up and says like, hey, I, you owe me 25 grand, Harrow. And he just backslaps her and says like, you do not get to humiliate me. And then Pike jumps in saying like, don't you hit her. She's a nice lady. And then at that point, Green Arrow jumps in and just like, hi guys, I'm here to break this up. So then immediately Harrow's like, get this guy. I'll give you 10 grand if you kill him right here, but give me his head. And he strings up Harrow as all the other guys are coming to attack. And then he does like the dirty Harry thing. He's like, go ahead, try to shoot me, make my day. And he's just like standing around with arrows trained on all of them, despite the fact that he is very blatantly down to like three arrows. So yeah, that's where we end. I'm going to tell you the best part about this issue. It is the second to last and the sent issue. Next issue is the last one, and then we're getting into Jeff Lemire's arc. And um, I cannot wait. I absolutely... Like, why... why I, If you could tell me that the entirety of this arc is Green Arrow suffering from a head injury... I'd probably buy it more. But the fact... And when I say arc, I mean starting with Anne Nascenti. It's just... What are, what, why are we doing this? Was It just seems so nothing and yet so strangely complicated all at the same time. I don't get it. Ugh. I'm sorry. Also, Freddie Williams, very stylistic artist. He did a great job in Captain Adam. Not bad at all. Not for this book. This book, maybe it's the colorist, maybe it's what they're asking him to draw, how it's more street level stuff. I've said this before, does not work here. So overall, I gotta give this one, I gotta give it like a 3.5, because I got four marked down here as passable, and honestly, this isn't even passable. This is just, it's too much. So 3.5, and I look forward to the final issue of Anacenti's run next month. World's Finest, number seven, written by Paul Levitz, art by Kevin McGuire and George Perez. Last issue, we had Helena getting caught by Robin, Damian Wayne, stealing money. Apparently, it's been a pattern of things she's not responsible for. And then Helena tells Damian literally everything. So this issue picks up with uh, Power Girl, Karen, flying the pair of them to a location that apparently a digital trail was found to have ended at and they're going to try to track down who's stealing the money from Wayne Tech and Karen's like you told him our secrets and she's like yeah he's my brother kind of sort of so she drops them off in this snowy tundra place and says like all right it's a mile that way you guys have fun I'm gonna go take care of the other digital trail which is somewhere in the Congo and she flies off and as soon as they turn around they are surrounded by a massive wolf pack that is backing them off the edge of a cliff. So then Karen flies down to the Congo and she's like, man, you know what? This place is pretty nice. There's still a lot of animals and stuff. They aren't completely destroyed by apocalypse. So uh, that's nice. And she sees an elephant and she's like, oh, hey, big guy. And she uses her supervision to find a little grass hut in the middle of the Congo that has a massive satellite dish coming out of it. And she's like, I'm betting that's the place I need to go to. And as soon as she walks up to the door, she's immediately fired upon by a group of seemingly child soldiers who each have uh, a rifle in hand. And they all start firing at her. And she's like, oh, that's cute, but it's not going to do anything to me. Until the smallest one comes up with a apocalyptic like laser beam and shoots at her. And it just demolishes her, blows her back. So I'm going to cut back to the Arctic fight and... Huntress is just firing into the her arrows into the wolves, and Damien seemingly is just kicking them off the cliff. And he's like, hey, what happens when you run out of arrows? And she's like, I'm willing to bet that no matter what earth you're on, fire is the trick. And she sets one of the wolves on fire, but the wolf literally keeps on lunging at her. So now she's got a flaming wolf after her, bites into her arm, and Damien's like, hey, I'm not finished with her yet. And he throws the wolf off the edge of the cliff and says, like, all right, you good? Batman... 
Batman taught me to never let a beast be a threat. So they make their way towards the hut that they're looking for. Meanwhile, Karen comes to. All the kids are standing over with guns. They're speaking in French, mind you. And they're just like, oh, demon, depart from our land. We are the protectors here. And they're like, okay, yeah, sure, whatever. And she uses her super breath and just blows all of them away. And just like, all right, so I'm going to melt all your guns with my heat vision. I'm going to pick up this one that's apocalyptic. And I'm going to take it for my own thing. Also, she looks around and she sees in the sky a strange weather pattern coming in, like a storm that was unexpected. And then all of a sudden, a giant portal opens up the same one that sucked them through to this world and she gets out of the way of it uh the hut and all the kids are sucked inside of it and she's like well i ain't getting trapped in that and she just flies away as it all disappears and she's like well those poor poor kids but i got myself a shiny cool gun so let's get this looked at so she flies away and then we get damien and huntress finally getting to this cabin again with a massive satellite dish on top and Damien starts climb, climbing up, and she's, he's like, do it quietly. We don't want to alert anybody. And Huntress, because she was trained by Catwoman, just jumps up on top of the roof in like a single bound. Which I don't think that's how that works, but regardless, uh, she starts hacking into the satellite. And Damien's like, you should have waited for me to, to give you cover, to watch your back. And as he's saying so, uh, a wolf man is climbing up out of a... I don't know, hatch in the roof, and Damien stomps it shut. Damien get or Helen Helena gets all the stuff she needs, and Damien's like, All right, let's go. And then he looks down and sees the wolf man has got is standing right there, grabs hold of him, and she he screams out for Helena's help. Helena just jumps off the roof, fires a crossbow into the thing's back, and it's down. And I really want to point out that this wolf man is the cover of the of the issue, that it is hunting them. And it's done. Like, that's ridiculous. And Damien's like, uh, that thing isn't, like, a real thing. Like, that shouldn't exist. And she's like, yeah, it's probably, like, from Apocalypse, you know, Dark Side and all that stuff. And Damien's like, I gotta tell my dad about this. And she's like, no problem. Tell him all about all this, except for me. Leave me out of it. And he's like, deal, sis. So they shake hands and that's the end of the issue unoffensive perfectly fine i guess it does seem i don't even want to say rushed because i can't even think of any like it didn't seem it was just a very fast-paced arc it was like last issue they met up they agreed to work together this issue they did and they got everything they needed and like there was barely a fight put up the entire way through like I don't know, I'm so used to writers writing for the trade, where every arc has to be like six or seven issues, that to see this little two-issue thing is just like, that's it? We're not going to get into the deep, darker mode? We're not going to get to the point where Damien thinks he can't trust Helena anymore, and he goes his own way, but then in the end comes back to help her in her time of need? Like, I'm used to that. It's so weird to see just this two little, eh, no, they just go on a little adventure. So I can't fault it for it. It is it's a fine enough to told story. It's just so different from what I get usually. So overall, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say six point five. And the only reason it's not higher is that it is just so sparse. Like it isn't really a full story. Yes, they got some information and whatnot, but it really feels like kind of a sidetrack thing. And then they're just like maybe next issue we'll find out more in terms of who was stealing this money but it feels like the little damien sidestep was its own little mini arc in here and that's just done with now so yeah it was interesting wasn't great it's a 6.5 G.I. Combat number seven written by peter tomasi art by howard chaikin so last issue uh, the Stuarts went with the haunted tank into the Arctic and they ran across a Nazi war wheel. I'm not explaining it more than that. So we get a little flash sideways here of the man who's running the whole thing. And it turns out to be the grandson of Rommel, who I guess had an assassination attempt against Hitler. And 
he's been hearing Rommel call and say like, oh, you need to uh, build a war wheel because why not? Because I guess they were building war wheels back in the day, but this is a bigger one, stronger, with more guns. So he's called the Winter Fox and he is the one pilot, or not pilot, but running this war wheel. He's the minds behind it. So it's firing on the haunted tank. The stewards are firing back at it. And they're like, we can't get through this thing. It's too thick. The only way we're going to be able to get it is if we get inside. And so the younger steward is like, all right, I'm going to get up there. You cover me. And for the love of God, don't let the ghost do the aiming. So he jumps out of the tank. He makes his way over to the wheel, grabs onto the side of it as it's spinning upwards. And as he's doing so... Uh, he's trying to find a entry hatch. All the guns start re-aiming towards him, and we see the older Stuart is... He's, he shoots out the guns, and he's like, Oh, you got it. No, you Get in there, sonny boy. So he finds a hatch. He gets it open, and he jumps inside. But as he does so, the wheel stops rolling and starts flying, like flying saucer-wise. And Jeb's in the tank like, oh, those crafts think of everything. So he's like, all right. General, he pulls out his sword. He's in the tank. He's like, we got one more fight in us. We got to get in there and save my boy. And the tank teleports out and then teleports back on top of the war wheel. So inside the war wheel, uh... I blank on his name, but the younger Stuart makes his way through and he comes across a man who's hooked up Matrix style into the war wheel. And he's like, what in the heck? And then he gets shot in the shoulder. Rommel comes out, the grandson of Rommel, and he's like, ah, yes. And he's speaking in German this whole time. So literally, like, I, the younger Stuart's unable to understand any of this. But the reader gets it and he turns out this guy hooked up Matrix style is the original Rommel. And he is just basically a mind slave here to pilot the war wheel. And so uh, the younger Stuart's down and Jeb steps up. He shows up in the tank. He uses a saber to cut off the younger Rommel's arm. And he's like, I sure hope that was his side heel uh, hand. And sorry, his name's Scott. And so Scott and Jeb get back up and they're like, all right, well... I've, I fought against this guy in the war before, and as I always told your grandmother, I hate reunions. So he takes a saber, stabs it through the older Rommel, and immediately the younger one has his gun out and shoots Jeb. So Scott picks up the sword, uses it to stab the younger Rommel, and now both the Rommels and Jeb are dying. And Scott runs over to Jeb and is just like, hey, could you do me a favor and not let me die in this hunk of junk? And he's like, oh, hang on, Grandpa. And he gets him out of the war wheel, back up to the tank, sets him in there. And Jeb's like, what's your name, boy? And he's like, I'm a steward, Grandpa. I always have been. And so Jeb passes away and he calls out to the ghosts of his uh, men that he fought with back in World War II. And he's like, hey, guys, I'll be with you soon. And... As the war wheel starts crashing down to Earth, the uh, tank teleports out. So some, we cut back over to Jeb's house, and the boy who was trying to get his baseball all the way in the first issue, uh, he's finally got it, and at that moment, the tank teleports in and crashes the, into the roof of Jeb's house as Jeb has been shown to pass away. So some time passes. He's buried in Arlington. Uh, Scott's getting an American flag for his grandfather service and steve trevor comes up and he's like hey so um i know the army asked you some questions they're satisfied with your story but argus most certainly isn't so um i brought you a souvenir and he brings the saber that was lodged into rommel's chest and he's like this belongs to your family you should have it and he's like oh thank you trevor and trust me i know nothing happened down there and i won't be sharing a word of it and he's like cool great i mean we genuinely don't know where the haunted tank is and it seems like only a steward's able to control it anyway. So if we ever need you, we hope that you'll be on call. And he's like, well, I don't know where it is anyway. It's not like I can hear it calling to me literally every moment of every day. And Steve's like, right, yeah, okay, anyway, bye. And we see that J uh, Scott is still able to talk to Jeb, like mentally, the same way that Jeb was able to talk to the general and the haunted tank is back in the weird like hall of mysteries thing that it originally was in 
The end. I think it was a satisfying conclusion. I think it was fine. It had a little tone of family to it. It did a whole thing of how absolutely bad shit insane the concept of the haunted tank and the war wheels are, but it it made it fun. It made it interesting. I think that the whole story of Haunted Tank, while brief, was solidly told. So I have really no qualms with it. Um, I'll give it like a seven. And I mean, that seven's kind of representing the entirety of the Haunted Tank arc here from the last, like, what, three, four issues. But it's still good. It's still, with just this one issue, is still fine within its own right. Um, Art-wise, I followed it the whole way through. looked great. I mean, yeah, I really, it's a, it's not blowing my hair back. It's not an incredible story. It's not the defining Haunted Tank story. It's just a fun little romp, and I really think that, this was the right place to put it. It's just a backup story to a otherwise probably uneventful comic. So, seven. Stormwatch number 15, written by Peter Milligan, art by Will Conrad and Cliff Richards. Last issue, we had Harry showing back up, now posing as a Shadow Lord, and Midnighter says that he doesn't want to go with Apollo away from Stormwatch. So we open up and Harry's basically laying out his thing as the Shadow Lord. He's like, here's the deal. Stormwatch has always kind of been like a preventative measure, like we jump in when trouble arises. Um changing that up now we're gonna go after preemptively the superheroes because these superheroes are the biggest threats to mankind like ever and he just loads up pictures of superman green arrow not green arrow green lantern and batman and it's like these three are kind of like the pillars if you take them down everyone else will tumble and immediately storm is like you you want us to fight superman and he's like apollo you're like already kind of a superman patsy so yeah we think you can take them Batman, as far as we can tell, is just a guy, and Green Lantern, you guys can handle. No problem. And the entire time Midnighter's watching the Shadow Lord, like, I I recognize this, but I can't, like, the little moments, the little movements that he has, like, I can place it, but I can't. And at that point, um, Jack Hawksmore gets a call from the ship, and the ship recognizes that Emma Rice, the projectionist, the one who was taken by Harry, is still alive, and she's currently marching through Antarctica. And she's like, come on, ship, recognize me, open a door. And a teleporter door shows up, and she walks through. And immediately she's like, hi, guys, can I have a drink? And before anything else, Engineer just walks up and grabs her. And it's just like, you ran off with uh, Harry and you've been with him. We need to know what you know. And she's like, she, he kidnapped, you were there. And everyone else was like, yeah, we were there. He definitely kidnapped her. This is not his, like, yeah, but things can change. And so she takes one of her tendrils or whatever, plugs it into her head and just says like, let's see what really happened. And she, Emma claims Harry died. Harry died in the explosion. And so she loads up the memories in her brain and we see the explosion and the body of Harry afterwards and they're like okay rewind it a little bit let's just you know make sure that's what actually happened and then a blurry image starts coming through and midnighter's like i know i know this guy how do i know this guy and we see that the blurry image on screen is a memory of harry shaking hands with midnighter and saying how midnighter is going to betray the group and is actually only in a relationship with apollo so that he won't literally go all out and kill midnighter once the reveal happens. And immediately Apollo's like, oh, I'm sorry, what? And then there's like, this is definitely an implanted memory, totally fake. I recognize the guy now. The Shadow Lord is Harry. And the Shadow Lord's like, seriously, that's the best you got? Okay, everyone kill Midnighter. He's a traitor. So immediately Apollo goes after him, starts laying down shots. And... Midnighter's like, you can't hit me, man. I can predict your every oof gets hit in the back. And Apollo is still going all in. Shadow Lord's like, hey, uh, Jack Hawksmore, Jenny Quantum, go get Midnighter. And it's like, no, nah, I'm pretty sure Apollo's got this. So Apollo goes in and he's like super angry. And Midnighter's like, you don't understand. This isn't it. I'm not going to fight you. And then just by reflex, he punches Apollo's in the face. And he's like, I'm so okay, I got some instinctual stuff I'm working through, but I don't want to fight you. 
And the engineer grabs Midnighter, says like, oh, you poisoned Harry's mind. It's your fault, Midnighter. You're a psychopath. And he's like, yes, I am. But I didn't do that thing you said I did. And he rips off one of engineer's tendrils and grabs Emma and goes through the teleporter door back to the Antarctic. And engineer and the Shadow Lord both also go through. But because of the Earth's rotation, I guess, they end up in a totally different location, which doesn't make any sense to me, but whatever, it happened. So a Midnighter and Emma are making their way through the snow, and she's just like, why did you grab me? You could have grabbed anybody. Why me? And he's like, because you know what actually happened, and we're going to jog your memories and get that what actually happened out. And she's like, I know what actually happened. You made a deal with them. I saw it. And he's like, no, that's a fake memory. And you just don't remember the real stuff. I'm not capable of doing this to Stormwatch. At least I don't feel like I am. So at that point, we uh, see a mysterious figure coming up to them. And he's like, oh, who's that? Get ready to fight. But it turns out it's just like a scientist who's at a nearby science station. And it's just like, hey, you guys are going to die in like, Two minutes due to exposure if you don't get with me. So uh, let's get going. So Apollo flies up to the sun and he's like, I can't believe he betrayed me. This, he sucks. He's awful. And as he's getting closer to the sun, uh, Jenny Quantum's just sitting in the way. And he's like, hey, how's it going? Uh, engineer sent me to go find you. Uh, please don't burn yourself up in the sun. And he's like, I'm not going to burn myself up in the sun. I get supercharged by being close to the sun. I'm going to get super powered up and I'm going to go down and attack that two-timing bastard. So then uh, after they leave the science station, Emma and Midnighter are making their way through the Antarctic mountains. I don't even know if those are real, but regardless, they are. And he's like, all right, do you recognize any of these mountains as the base where Harry kept you? She's like, no, I don't recognize one snow-covered mountain from another. And he's like, all right, well, I don't like being out here in this place any more than you do, but we got to do this, so think. Um, and then we go back to the science station and see the scientists talking to Harry, the Shadow Lord, and he, they're just like, yeah, no, they, uh, they left about an hour ago. They went out somewhere, and they said something about uh, Harry Tanner and getting the truth about him. Uh, anyway, hope that helps. And he's like, yes, you've done mar magnificently. So then Harry calls in the entirety of the team, everyone who's left, except for Jack, who doesn't want to go to the Antarctic because it's not a city. And he's like, hey, guys, you should check out the science station. Seems that Midnighter showed up here and killed literally everybody inside. He's a rogue agent, and we need to take him out. And Apollo's like, oh, no. So, yeah, that's that. Um... I don't have a problem following any of the individual plot beats. I think that it was a perfectly reasonable jump from emotion to emotion. Like, okay, here's how this happened. Here's how that happened. My only major, I don't even want to say criticism, but my only major thing that I wish was different is that the entire Emma thing, like... Harry is now acting as a totally different character. He's the Shadow Lord now. All we need to know is he betrayed the team. That's fine. But Emma, we spent such a short time with, and we have such a limited understanding as to what she can do and who she even is right now, because clearly she was faking that she was in love with Harry, but she also truly thinks that maybe Harry and Midnight are teamed up. It's, it's very vague. And if they're building it up to be a mystery as to, like, what actually happened, then so be it. But I don't feel like it's a mystery for the reader. For the reader, we know Midnighter didn't do this. We know Harry messed with things. I just want to know a bit more as to where Emma's standing. Hopefully that'll get cleared up soon. That's my own little personal thing on that. But overall, the story itself seems like a fine setup. This pretty much is just the part one, uh, comparatively to how the previous issues were. So this is starting up the arc, and I, I enjoy it. I think it's a fine enough arc. Um... I'll give it like a, feels like a seven. It feels pretty average, not great, not awful, just nice, kind of in the middle, but still slightly positive, seven. <music> Dial H number seven, written by China Myville, art by David Lapham. This is the start of a new arc. 
where they got a lead on where a new dial might be. So we open up with a basically trip around the world, Prague, Nairobi, Tokyo, a place called Peckingham in England. And we see that Nelson has been using the dial all over the world as they've been trying to track down where this new dial is and being a hero, uh, wherever is needed. And they trade off where Roxy's getting the, you know, it's every other day they trade off. And Nelson's just seeing the sights whenever it's otherwise Roxy's turn. But they uh, make their way to a hotel and they basically say, yeah, no, we've been trying to track down where this dial is. And as Nelson's doing his heroics, uh, these heroes are popping up in basically pop culture. Like, obviously, in the DC universe, you have, like, magazines and stuff focused on, like, oh, where are the heroes now? And he sees all these different identities that he has been popping up as all over the world. So, like, Belgium, Canada, Zimbabwe. And he's just like, yeah, no, cool, we're famous. That's great. But Roxy's, of course, more focused on finding the dial. And we discover that there is a cult that has multiple different places all around the world that, you know, they know how the dial exists. They know its basic function. They praise it as like a deity sort of thing and they w worship the exchange and they're trying to get into all these cults to get to the higher up members to find out if anybody knows where the actual new dial is so at this point roxy's like i have we've been laying low trying to get in why don't we just go in big why don't we just like really go for it so they go to one of the leaders of this cult of the dial and Roxy shows up saying like, oh, it is I, the angel of the dial. And she's all hidden in shadow. But then she activates the hero dial and turns into a giant bug. <laughs> and it's just like, see, I changed. That's what the dial is. And the guy's like, oh, yes, praise be. You are an angel of the dial. And she's trying to speak French to the guy because he is French. And so Nelson's standing like behind the door whispering lines to her. And... Finally, Roxy's like, all right, if you are truly a devotee of the dial, then you will know where the other dial is. Prove yourself by revealing its location. So they just get it easily like that. Uh, meanwhile, we get a taxi going through Littlesville. I believe that's the city where um, X Nihilo was from. And we see a man in a taxi who has a uh, briefcase with him. And taxi driver's like, ah, oh, you're here to take some pictures? Yeah, no, the place is pretty run down, but uh, I'm sure you can make it look pretty. So he lets him off at the place where X-Nilo was. The place is all taped up with police tape, and he just teleports past all the gates and whatnot, makes his way through, and seemingly starts investigating what's going on. But then we cut to a accountant named Brian Roche, who the guy has an appointment with and he's like hi i need your help accounting for some things and roche is like yes of course what's up and he's like oh it's nothing to do with money uh i know that you worked for x nilo and you started a new life here as an accountant i want to know everything that went on in that place and he's like um please don't i have a life and whatnot and i really don't want you to mess that up and he's like about to pull a gun but the guy's like if you pull that gun, you will be dead in your office and you will still have to start a new life, if even if you succeed. So if you want this to go smoothly, you're just going to tell me what I want to know. And he's like, all right, I'll tell you everything about x Nilo, Squid. And he's like, no, no, no. What do you know about the dial? So apparently the leader of the church said that the dial is in Atlantis, or more specifically, a little outpost deep beneath the sea that was linked to Atlantis. So they take a boat out, Roxy and Nelson, and they just start dialing over and over again until they get one that can breathe underwater. And they discover that if you uh, if you don't get one that works, you can type in hero backwards into the dial. So it is 6734, and that will speed up the reversal process. So all night they keep on changing over and over again until finally Roxy turns into the Planktonian, which is just a hive mind of plankton that just floats in the air. And it's like, well, it can breathe underwater. Here's your uh, mask for um, whatever it is, you know, Roxy's mask, Manto, and puts it like on the blob of plankton and it goes underwater. Uh, they, she had ends up coming to an underwater ruins of an Atlantean culture and they see there's art of the dial up in the 
walls and the place where the dial seemingly would be has already been taken and she sees there's a whole bunch of uh, scraps of like diver equipment and even a piece of clothing down there so she ends up picking it up and she sees sharks nearby and she's like sharks aren't predators to plankton like i'm totally fine with all these sharks but then a giant whale shows up and it's like oh wait no whale eat plankton that is an issue so the whale starts attacking but the planktonians just like no we are stronger we are we are more we are combined we are better and it all morphs together into a giant like hulk sort of figure and just punches the whale down into the ruins basically destroying everything and so the plankton come up uh she detransforms and reveals the little patch she has which is written in both english and french and she's like oh this is military it's special for forces uh and the only place that i think is english and french is canada and they look through the magazine again of all the superheroes and see one in canada that they don't think was actually them and so it has a dial on its belt though and it's like that must be him whoever it is we're looking for so they're off to Canada. Meanwhile, the dude with the briefcase, he uh, follows the accountant down multiple streets, finally ending up at a warehouse. And as he gets inside the warehouse, turns out the accountant knew the whole time. It was a setup, and they opened fire on the uh, guy with the briefcase. But it turns out the guy with the briefcase has his own set of powers where he's able to like rewind time and do it over again. And visually, it looks like multiple copies of him all like stacked in a line going backwards and able to change what happens. So he gets shot, he just rewinds, dodges the bullets next time, and it just keeps on going like that. And he's like, yeah, no, a lot, like I worked um, with the government and when they, or sorry, the authority that he worked for. He's like, when I worked with them, they all had suggestions for names, do-over, rubato, rewind. But the thing is, I know what I look like when I do this. So you can call me the centipede. As we see this winding trail of bodies all taking shots at the accountant and uh, basically using him to get info. And that's where it ends. I mean, I think this is... The first arc was absolutely insane, but it was more so because we didn't understand the rules of the dial. We didn't understand what we were working with, and it was very slowly revealed to us over time. Now we have a better idea. We understand more as to what's going on. And so the battle isn't between the people and the dial. The battle is between people over the dial. All these people who understand how it works and knows what they're looking for. So I'm interested. I, I think this is possibly one of the better written books out of all of DC right now. It's just the mythology behind it, the mysteries, the, how they're setting them up over time, all masterfully done. I honestly can't complain. And the art looks great too. So I'm going to give this a... I'm going to give it an 8. And the only reason I don't say 8.5 is because while the art is fantastic... I do think I preferred the style of the previous arc just a little bit more. Um, David Lapham does the art here. Again, great, but I think that I think it was Mateus Santaluco. The art just fit the style a bit more, a bit crazier and out there, whereas this one's a bit more house, but still good, still very good. So eight for right now. The Phantom Stranger, number three, written by Dan DiDio, art by Brent Anderson. Last issue, the Phantom Stranger got called in to protect Terrence 13, a ghost hunter from the haunted highwayman who has beef with his family. And now Phantom Stranger is on the end of a noose. So this issue picks up with a flashback to Phantom Stranger back when he was Judas hanging himself out of grief and guilt. And he was saying like, oh, I kind of wish that it, my, my act of contrition here would get me on the, into heaven, but turns out it didn't work then and it's not going to work now. So we see him still on the end of the noose, and Terrence Thirdeen's like, Haunted Highwayman, please. He has nothing to do with this. Don't hurt him. And Highwayman's like, No, I'm going to kill him, so that way his death's on your hands, much as mine was on your great-grandfather's -grand hands. But he notices that it's taken a really long time for Phantom Stranger to choke out. So he's like, okay, well, I'm just going to speed this along with my hands, if that's cool. And he goes to touch Phantom Stranger, and there's like a magical blast thing that um, sets 
it breaks the rope and sends Haunted Highwayman scrambling. And he's like, all right, well, Dawn's coming anyway. I can't do Dawn, but I'll be back tomorrow night and I'll kill you then, Terrence. Peace. And so he leaves. And Phantom Stranger's like, okay, I, I, I'm a little bit woozy. I don't think I'm okay. And he passes out for a second. And in doing so, he sees a dog, tiny little, like, terrier. And the terrier comes up to him in a Scottish accent. I'm not going to do the Scottish accent. He says, Laddie, best you resolve this. Tis not the reason you're on Earth. There'll be greater evils to deal with. And then he wakes up. And Terrence 13 is like, hey, man, you good? And he's like, no, I'm not good. Tell, explain to me the story of the Haunted Highway, man. And if you were reading All-Star Western like six months ago, this was a backup. But basically he recounts exactly what happened in the backup. That the Terrence 13 family back in the 1800s, it was more about showing the ghost didn't exist. He was disproving all the supernatural stuff. And back in those days, there was a guy named, uh, I think it was Rude. Yeah, Jonathan Rude, who he was a professor, wanted to make some extra money. I think he got fired. And he took up being this haunted highwayman to scare people out of their money. And Terrence 13 disproved it. Uh, it was a very public trial. Rude's wife ended up dying just out of, like, shame. And so he cursed Terrence 13, saying, your family will always be cursed by me, the haunted highwayman. And so now it is an actual ghost that comes and haunts them down. So some Terrence 13, he apparently fought the ghost once more. He survived numerous other members of the family tree didn't survive as well but now it comes down to this terrence and he's hoping he's not going to be in the same clump and at that point phantom strange is like so this is a family issue and i don't have a part in it and terrence is like please don't just come on you you got to help me a little bit here he's like actually no i don't i'm gonna go peace wait real quick by the way do you have a dog no okay never mind bye so the next night uh, in his persona of Philip, he goes with his wife to a neighbor's party. The neighbor uh, has a major job at work, and he's going to be gone for six months to, I believe, the Philippines. And um, they're here to say goodbye. So they make their way inside, and everyone's like, Oh, hey, Elena, Phil's wife. It's so nice to see you. It's so great you're here. And Phil, you actually came to a party. That's weird. Uh, but at that point, Elena starts socializing, and the husband who's leaving is just like, Phil, hey. Great to see you here. I just want to have a talk. Real quick, are you a religious man? And he's like, uh, why do you ask? And he's like, well, I don't know. I just, I'm going to Thailand to build these condos. And I just, I don't know if this is really like my purpose. If like, this is the track I'm supposed to be on. And he's like, well, if you don't like it, you don't have to do it. And he's like, I mean, I, 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 it's my job. I have to do it. It's some of the things. It's like, okay, then do it. And he's like, but I don't know if I want to do it. And he's like, Okay, I don't know what to do with you here, buddy. And he's like, look, I'm, I'm going to go do this. It's, it's what I need to do, even if it's not something I want to do. I'm going to be spending six months away from my family. I'm trusting you to be the family for them, to step in, be a father figure while I'm gone. And it's just like, yeah, sure, of course. And he's like, thanks, man. You really are a pal. Anyway, I'm going to go socialize. Peace. And so he steps out and Phil is just kind of like, man, all right, I guess I'm doing that. And then another neighbor shows up and says, like, hey, um, I got a call on my phone from a block number asking for you. And Stranger picks up the phone. And he's like, hello. And, of course, it's Terrence 13 again. And so Stranger shows up. He's like, you, what are you, I told you not to call me again. He's like, no, you said not to call your house. I called your neighbor's phone. Totally okay. Anyway, Haunted Highway Man is here. And as he's like, dude, you know I could kill you, right? And he's like, yeah. But Haunted Highwayman will kill me. So I'm going to take the could over the will. So anyway, Haunted Highwayman shows up. And he goes after Terrence. And Stranger puts up a magic shield of like, Oh, well, this will keep us safe for a moment. But we need to figure out what to do. And he's like, All right, I think I got an idea. And as the Haunted Highwayman's like, Hey, this is this is a blood feud. This is a family curse. You gotta let me in. He's like, yeah, no, I know it's family. So how about you fight the person you're actually upset with? And he summons the ghost of the original Terrence 13, the one from the 1800s. And he's like, Jonathan Rude, you bastard. I killed you once. I'll kill you again. And he's like, ah, oh, oh crap, the original. And so Ter the original Terrence just gets him in a headlock and says like, you've committed countless crimes against my family. I'm taking you with me. And so they both like, disapparate back into heaven or whatever and 
but before they do, the new Terrence 13 is like, this is incredible, it's an ectoplasmic event, transdimensional, there are ghosts fighting in my office. And the original Terrence 13 is like, Sonny, I thought that our family would have taught you there's no such thing as ghosts. Peace. And so then he goes off to heaven or hell or whatever. And still took out. Oh, all right, well, that was something. Uh, but the old Terrence 13 makes the point that Phantom Stranger did a good deed for the family, so now the family owes him. So the new Terrence 13 is like, so I guess that makes us partners now. And Phantom Stranger just turns, looks at him, causes a magic blast that literally blows out all of the tech in his office and says, no, we are not partners. Do not ever contact me again. And then just vanishes away. And we're left with Terrence just going like, that was awesome. Um, that was a pretty, I, I think that was a good little two-part story. I genuinely, I don't have any issues with that. I, it was a nice little thing. It gets us more introduced into a little bit more of Stranger's home life, like the way that he's building up his family, uh, the way he feels about them, and how it's not really an act. He genuinely does care about them. I'm all for it. I think that it adds a little bit of depth to a character that I personally don't really know much about at all. Um, Power-wise, I'm still a little bit hazy. It seems that he can just do holy spells. Like, he's a cleric. That's the best way to put it. Not really sure what all that entails, but... Clearly, he's very powerful, so I'm at least interested in the character from a characterization standpoint more than a power standpoint, at least right now. Uh, overall, I'd say this one's a 7.5. I can't really say exactly why. It just kind of feels 7.5 to me. Uh, definitely very rewarding to have read both the original All-Star Western back up and then this as well. It, it's just a nice little bit of synergy across different titles here. So, yeah, 7.5. Human Bomb, number one, written by Justin Gray and Jimmy Palmiotti, art by Jerry Ordway. This is the third miniseries, along with The Ray and the Phantom Lady miniseries. They kind of just cover this little itty-bitty character with the through line of Uncle Sam. So we pick up this issue with a dream sequence. We have our main character, Mike Taylor. He is getting an honorary medal from, I want to say, the president. It's in the White House, but it's clearly not the president delivering it, so... I guess just like a commander or something. Regardless, as he shakes hands after getting the medal, his hand starts glowing and then the whole White House blows up. And he wakes up from the dream being like, ah, oh, gee, same dream every time. And we see that Mike Taylor is a construction worker in New York City. He's working on the new World Trade Center, which was still being built at that time. And all the construction guys are, you know, just telling a story like, oh, yeah, we were down at the bar. This guy was giving us a hard time. Then Mike stepped up here, and he was so cool. He scared the guy, and the guy offered to pay for our drinks all night. Mike, you're great. And Mike's like, nah, I'm just a guy. And the foreman comes in saying, hey, why is everyone standing? Get to work, except for you, Mike. Now, Mike, we, we know that you're going to, next month, you're going to meet the president to get yourself a medal. Are you nervous? And he's like... I mean, not really, but I still meeting the president. That's kind of a big thing. Uh, he's like, yeah. So because you're meeting the president, um, I got a buddy of mine who basically apparently the insurance company is saying that uh, there was a pre-existing condition. I think that it has something to do with like first responders to 9-11 and how insurance companies like were not paying out stuff because of that it's kind of under the radar here but yeah either way he's like if you're going to talk to the president maybe you could just bring it up but then as they're talking about this a whole bunch of explosions go off and they look over the new york skyline and they see just a bunch of smoke and they're like oh dear god do we have another terrorist attack and everyone starts making their way out of the building as fast as they can uh everyone's on their phones trying to call people and Mike looks over and sees this one guy from his old squad. And he's like, Smitty, is that you? Smitty, what's up? And he goes and he tries to get Smitty, but Smitty's walking back into the building. He's like, what are you doing, Smitty? And he realizes something must be going on. So he tackles Smitty to the ground. And Smitty says, remember Crown. And immediately Smitty just blows up. But it looks that uh, Mike is actually absorbing the explosion into himself. So let me cut to Afghanistan three years ago with Mike's squad making their way through basically a firefight. And they duck down into an alley. 
And as they get down there, they are jumped with a blinding light and then are immediately all hit with some sort of electrifying darts. And we see that the people who attack them are not Taliban. They're not any sort of enemy combatants. They are some sort of secret group squad coming in and basically taking the whole group hostage. Um, at that point, Mike wakes back up and one of the construction guys come in being like, dude, there was an explosion and how are you okay right now? And he's like, I don't know. Can I go to the hospital? And we see a man across the street on a phone saying like, ah, number bomb number 23 went off the grid, referencing Smitty. He was trying to reference bomb number 17. And 17 is apparently an abnormality. So the guy on the phone walks over to Mike, grabs him by the throat, and just says, diffuse, diffuse, diffuse. He just repeats it over and over again. But uh, Mike reaches out a hand, hits the guy in the chest, and an explosion goes off. Guy goes flying, and he's like, Oh, geez. Okay, I don't know what's going on. But everyone's watching Mike. He's like, oh my God, I think that guy, he had a bomb. No, wait, he is the bomb. It's like on the news. Because clearly all these explosions were linked to people exploding. So at this point, the guy's back on the phone. And he's like, oh, bomb number 17 is gone rogue. Override has failed. I'm tracking him now. So he chases down the guy. He does some crazy acrobatics and whatnot. And Mike just keeps on hitting them with like an open hand punch which keeps on causing explosions it sends the guy flying and he's like you are causing way too many witnesses right now this is all your fault you need to be terminated and he's like go to hell and he just runs away away from the guy far enough that he's able to escape and the guy jumps back on the phone and he's like human bomb 17 has escaped uh many eyes are watching us and he's like well get rid of him so immediately this guy is revealed to be human bomb number 50 and he explodes taking out an entire city block so then we cut to shade headquarters shade being uh frankenstein agents of shade but this seems to be a different part of the organization where basically they are keeping track of all these explosions going on they're trying to trace down exactly what's going on and they saw the whole mike thing happening and they were like hey all right we got this guy Mike, uh, we have a couple, we have a list of terrorist resources that we think might be behind it. And they show the list of Capricorn, Renegade, Orbital, Warriors, and Nesbali, which they show this to Uncle Sam. And Uncle Sam's like, wait a minute, hold on. Take the first letter of each of those. What do you get? And it's like, oh no, it spells crown. Which, the fact that they were just coincidentally in that order, I don't feel like is whatever. Anyway, they're like, okay, crown. And so... Uh, Uncle Sam is like, all right, Sergeant Taylor, the guy, Mike, put him on all of the screens. And then he stands up and says, all right, everybody, this is just the first attack for a much larger terrorist strategy. Our number one thing is we bring in Mike Taylor immediately. So, yep. I mean, terrorist attack, New York, they got balls. I'll give them that. It's, um... It's something. Uh, I liked it. I think it was a, I think, you know, it's a character that's not really a superhero per se. It's just more of a weapon, but it's still attached to a person. And it's going to be a thing of, he doesn't know how to control his powers. He didn't even know he had powers. So I'm, I'm intrigued at least. They've got me interested with the first issue, which I think was more than to be said with the Phantom Lady one. Um... I would say any critiques is that it is extremely dated by the fact of them specifically they're working on the world like they specifically are working on the new world trade center so obviously that was going to date it but clearly we're supposed to be reading this in 2012 the fact they didn't even put it in a trade like yeah it's 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 not exactly something that was going to be timeless and i don't think it's supposed to be so it's a good little story for what it is i'm going to give it a I give it a seven. It's not feeling amazing, but it's also not bad in any way. It's just a good little first chapter. So we'll see how Human Bomb continues over the next three issues. And that's it. That's all the comics that came out from DC Comics this December 5th, 2012. And before you go, because there's nothing of value after this point, except for the secret code at the end, uh just want to remind you that there is a Discord now. 
There's always been a Discord, but I haven't been plugging it. Uh, because Twitter is a trash fire, come on over to Discord. It is a link in the description. Invites are free. Go ahead, stop in. I'll be there. I will not say hello to you. Okay, yes, I will. But don't pretend like we're friends. Okay, we're friends. But don't ask me for money. Anyway, let's talk about comics coming out next week. December 12th, 2012, we have 13 more comics, including the number 15 issues of Batgirl, Batman, Batman and Robin, Superboy, Green Lantern Corps, Deathstroke, Grifter, Suicide Squad, Legion Lost, Demon Knights, and Frankenstein. Additionally, we have the number 7 issue of The Ravagers and the number 3 issue of Team 7. So, yeah. Not really a whole lot to talk about. Uh, I lied about the secret code thing. There is no secret code. I just wanted you to stick around. Very sorry about that. Anyway, contractual obligations. We have a bunch of social media stuff. There is a Twitter, there is a Patreon, and there is a Discord, as I mentioned before. All the links are in the description. Anything that you do is much appreciated. But thank you very much for watching, listening. However it is you consume this podcast, please give it a thumbs up, five stars. Give us your lunch money, you dweeb. And uh, always try to remember, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. <laughs>